there. My name is Nelly Mabaso. Did you know that it is possible for a deep sea diver to see a shark around a rock if they look up? <laughs> Sounds impossible, but if the shark and the diver are in the right positions, it is possible. How this happens exactly is what we are going to investigate in this lesson. By the end of today's lesson, you will be able to explain total internal reflection by drawing ray diagrams. In order to understand how total internal reflection occurs, we need to first go back over a few concepts you have already learned. When we talk about optical density, we are talking about how quickly or slowly light moves through a substance or a medium. Air has a low optical density because light can move through it quickly, whereas something like plastic has a high optical density because light travels through it slowly. When light moves from a low optical density to a high optical density, we know that the light will be refracted. The light is refracted in such a way that it moves closer to the normal because the light ray is slowing down. Here, the angle of incidence is larger than the angle of refraction. However, when light moves from a medium of high optical density to a medium of low optical density, the refracted ray moves away from the normal because light is speeding up. Here, the angle of incidence is smaller than the angle of refraction. Now, with those concepts at the back of our minds, let's go back to the lab and investigate what happens as we change the angle of incidence of light as it moves from a medium of high optical density to low optical density. Hello there guys, today we're going to investigate how light travels through a rectangular perspex block. Now I'm going to put the block onto a piece of paper and draw a mark around it. Now we're doing this so that once we've done our investigation, we can be able to measure our angles. Okay, now I'm going to shine the light through the perspex block. There we go. And I've already marked the path where the light travels, just as we've done before. Now I want you to notice something here. When this light enters the block, you can clearly see that it's refracted towards the normal. This pink light there gets closer to the normal here on the pencil line. And now I'm going to move my light to my new incidence angle, which is inside the block there. There we go. And relative to the normal here, you can see that the light is reflected, reflected away from the normal. The pink light here is away from the normal. And that's exactly what we expected to see. I'll adjust the angle at which the light strikes the second boundary. Now watch the second refracted ray carefully. Can you see that the second angle of refraction keeps getting bigger and bigger as we change the angle of incidence? Now, I'm going to adjust the angle of incidence until the second reflected ray runs parallel to the side of the block. The angle of incidence at this point is what we're now interested in. It's a special angle, which we call the critical angle for perspex. 
The critical angle of any substance is the angle of incidence which results in an angle of refraction of 90 degrees. Now this angle changes depending on the substance. Watch what happens when I increase the angle of incidence so that it's bigger than the critical angle. Notice how the light is no longer refracted, but now it's reflected inside the block. No light crosses the boundary at this point. Now this type of reflection is called total internal reflection. Let's go back to the studio to look at these concepts in a little more detail. Let's draw ray diagrams to illustrate what we have just seen. We are only going to draw what happens at the boundary between the perspex and the air. When the light hits the boundary at an angle of incidence which is less than the critical angle, the light will be refracted. It is refracted away from the normal because the light speeds up. If the light hits the boundary at an angle of incidence which is equal to the critical angle, the light is still refracted away from the normal, but it is refracted so far from the normal that it runs parallel to the boundary. The angle of refraction is now 90 degrees. Once we have an angle of incidence that is greater than the critical angle, the light is refracted so much that it cannot leave the medium. This results in the light being reflected. This is called total internal reflection. There are two important conditions for total internal reflection to happen. Firstly, the angle of incidence must be greater than the critical angle of the substance it is traveling through. And secondly, the light must be traveling from a high optical density to a low optical density. From what you have just learned, can you explain why light needs to move from a high optical density to a low optical density? In other words, why can we not get total internal reflection if the light is moving from a low optical density to a high optical density? Well, the explanation is quite simple. When light moves from a high optical density to a low optical density, the light is refracted away from the normal. As the angle of incidence gets larger, the angle of refraction needs to get bigger as well. This results in the light moving further and further away from the normal and closer and closer to the boundary. Eventually, the light will run parallel to the surface. It then can go no further away from the normal, so the light reflects back into the medium instead of being refracted. When we consider how light moves from a low optical density to a high optical density, it is easy to see why we won't get total internal reflection. As light moves from a low optical density to a high optical density, it is refracted towards the normal. This means that the light will never be refracted so that it will touch the boundary. But we have just looked at what happens with a rectangular block. Let's see if this will happen with a triangular prism. Hi there, I have a triangular glass prism. I've set up the ray box already and after I dim the lights, I'm going to let a ray hit the one side of the triangular glass prism. Can you see that the light does exactly what is expected? When it moves from the air into the glass, it's refracted towards the normal. It doesn't go straight there, it moves towards the normal. And when it leaves the glass, back into the air, it's refracted away from the normal. Notice that here the sides of the triangular prism are not parallel to each other. And the incident ray and the imagined ray are not parallel either. Okay, so now let's change the first angle of incidence. Once again, the light behaves just as we expected it to. As the light moves into the prism, 
is refracted towards the normal and not continuing straight there. And as it moves away from the prism, is refracted away from the normal. But you notice something special about the way this ray of light is refracted. The angle of refraction here is equal to 90 degrees. So the angle of incidence must be the critical angle for glass. From what you've learned so far, what do you think is going to happen if I adjust the angle of the light again? So that the incidence angle inside the prism is greater than the critical angle. Mm-hmm, that's right. The light will not be refracted, but will be reflected back into the prism. Well, let's see. Watch, I'll adjust the angle at which the light hits the prism. Now the angle of incidence inside the prism is greater than the critical angle. And look at that. Just as we predicted, the light is reflected totally back into the prism. It does not cross this boundary here at all. Let's go back to studio now and draw a ray diagram showing what you've just learned. Okay, now you've seen how the light is reflected inside the prism. Let's look at the appropriate ray diagram. We start off with the prism. This triangle represents the prism. As always, the normal is 90 degrees to the surface. The first incident ray hits the surface of the prism and forms the angle of incidence. The light is refracted towards the normal. See the label, angle of refraction. Another normal is added on the second side. This is the second angle of incidence. But now, the light isn't refracted, it is reflected. We must remember that the angle of reflection is equal to the second angle of incidence. Don't forget, the second angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. Let's take one final look at the final diagram. Do you think that you can now explain, using what you have just learned, why a diver can see a shark around a rock? It's because of total internal reflection. Watch. Light from the shark hits the boundary between the water and the air above, but the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, which means the light will be reflected. If the diver looks up at the right moment, the reflected light will enter his eyes and so he will see the shark. You see, if the diver and shark aren't in exactly the right position, the diver wouldn't be able to see the shark. So, today we have learned that when light hits the boundary between two different media, such as water and air, it is possible for the light to be reflected back into the water so that the diver can see the shark. But the conditions for this are that the light must be moving from high optical density to a low optical density. The angle of incidence must also be greater than the critical angle of the medium with the high optical density. Remember, the critical angle is a special angle of incidence, which results in an angle of refraction of 90 degrees. This means that the refracted ray will run parallel to the boundary of the two media. A few lessons ago, you were required to make a device for looking around corners using a mirror. Today's problem is very similar. You are going to try to construct a device for looking over walls using two 90 degree prisms instead of mirrors. You'll need to draw ray diagrams to show how your device works. If possible, try to make a working model with cardboard and the two prisms. Have fun. Well, that is all for today.